Hi everyone, my name is Meg McCarrick and I'm an application scientist at ChemAxon. I'm going to talk today about how we might handle the cheminformatic challenges of dealing with massively large virtual libraries. Then I'll drill down to a couple of test cases, which are reaction-based combinatorial libraries and DNA-encoded libraries. This is what I mean by real in the title because you can screen a huge library of real compounds using Dell technology. For some context to this talk, I'll start with some well-known and large diverse libraries. How many of you have searched large online databases like eMolecules, for example? Large diverse vendor libraries like these are great for enriching your corporate HTS screening deck. And if you're a computational chemist like me, you've probably downloaded a ton of large databases like eMolecules or Zinc in order to run virtual screening campaigns. One problem that tends to get larger as our screening libraries expand is the cost of running an HTS screen. For this reason, companies with huge libraries sometimes forgo screening of the full deck on all of their projects. It becomes expensive to buy these compounds, run QC on them, and screen them. Compared to a huge diverse compound library, full combinatorial libraries were explored in the 1990s with limited success compared to their sheer numbers of compounds. For a while, it was thought that these libraries were not diverse enough, were too large, and covered too little chemical space. However, a lot has changed over the years when it comes to combinatorial libraries. Mainly, the way we use them, design them, and think about them has changed. Enamine, BI, Pfizer, Merck, and many others have developed extremely large virtual libraries, which are meant to represent the full chemical space, which is accessible to synthetic chemists. They combine the knowledge of available building blocks, including proprietary ones, with well-validated reactions and reactant, reaction rules. Making and screening all of these compounds would still have a huge price tag not to mention how many resources would be required. But that's not a problem because people think differently about these libraries today. They can be used as virtual libraries, which are an information source to help generate ideas. If the ideas are compelling enough, then the compounds are made in smaller focused libraries or even as single compounds. But think about this. 10 to the 11th, 10 to the 14th, or even 10 to the 20th virtual compounds. How are you going to store those even as a virtual compound? How much disk space would be required? And how long would it take to screen these libraries, even virtually? Here we run into another resource issue. More efficient ways of representing the virtual library as a set rather than single compounds must be used. In addition to huge virtual libraries, another technology has emerged to create huge libraries of real compounds which can be physically screened. DNA encoded libraries are a special case of combinatorial library. There are many different variations on this type of library, but for today's discussion, let's assume a traditional DNA encoded library setup where the DNA is attached to a linker and then directly attached to the small molecule of interest. Each time a reaction occurs with a chemical building block being added to the small molecule, of the smaller molecule N, that is, a corresponding oligonucleotide tag is added to the DNA end of the system to record which building block was used. Split and pool chemistry is used for each cycle, and in the end, you can put all of the compounds, usually in the millions, into one well for affinity-based screening. This is a really efficient and remarkable way to find new chemical matter for targets of interest. Current DNA sequencing techniques have evolved enough to give a signal even for a very minuscule amount of DNA. So after washing out the compounds that don't want bind as well, sequencing will tell you which tags are enriched. There's a lot of technology that goes into designing DELs. I think it's going to be increasingly important as one piece of the hit finding process in pharma. Although the idea was proposed about 30 years ago, 
It's really taking off now due to advances in chemistry and biotech. So together, massive virtual and real libraries have enormous potential in drug discovery, but they also pose quite a cheminformatics challenge. Chemaxon tools have been used for a long time to create virtu large virtual libraries. For normal to large size combi libraries, we have a very robust enumeration tool called Reactor, where you can add reactivity, selectivity, and exclusion rules for different reaction types. For virtual screening, our tools such as 3D conversion, protonation, tautomerization are used to prepare libraries for virtual screening. But I think the most powerful uh, aspect of our tools for this purpose is that we're able to manage and represent compound libraries at three different levels as shown here. First, you can represent a library based simply on a set of reactants and the reactions to convert them to products. This is great if you want to store information about your, mostly about your reactants and reactions. Second, you could use Reactor to fully enumerate the Dell or Combi library into its component compounds. Obviously, at a certain size, this becomes unfeasible but it is just fine for many large libraries in the high millions or even low billions. And third, you can represent even enormous libraries in Marcouche space, as shown on the lower right. A Marcouche structure represents a full combinatorial set in terms of a core scaffold and R group definitions. For instance, the combinatorial library that I'm showing here has four R1 groups and two R2 groups for a total library size of eight. Once a huge virtual library is designed and represented electronically, the work isn't done. We still have to be able to search the library to pull out compounds of interest. At Chemaxon, we have recently developed some search methods, which we hope will solve part of the puzzle to make it simpler to work with very large virtual libraries. And now I'd like to illustrate a couple of examples where our new search tools can be used to great advantage. But don't expect any graphs or hard numbers. That's because I'm not looking at quantitative measurements of search speeds today, which are very dependent on the exact setup. I'm just thinking about how our tools can help to meet the cheminformatic challenges of dealing with huge compound libraries. So here's workflow number one. Let's say I'm a researcher working in a group that creates DNA encoded libraries, or if I'm working with a collaborator who does this. In this scenario, I'm involved in early drug discovery. And on the left here, there's a starting molecule that I found in the literature. I like this particular reference compound because it has the activity I'm interested in. And I know that I have some DNA encoded libraries with a similar looking core. So this might be a good scaffold hopping exercise. First, I check Kemble or my other online sources to see what's most similar that's available. And also what type of activity data is known for the similar compounds. It turns out there are 478 with the core as drawn. And these compounds have over 3000 bioactivities. So quite a bit is known about this core. Next, in this scenario, I want to know if any of the compounds in my existing Dell libraries are similar to this reference compound. And similarity is kind of a loose term. It really depends on the metric, how you're measuring it. For instance, the fingerprints and uh, say if you're using Tanamoto similarity. So I prefer to cast a broad net at first and measure similarity using several metrics. And I can always narrow it down later once I examine the hits from the search. Chemaxon has a rich tool set for similarity and substructure searching. As many of you are aware, this is one of our strengths. We're known for our fast search engines such as MADFAST and our Oracle and Postgres cartridges. But today I wanted to talk about our recently developed 
um, additional tools for similarity, the rule-based search using MCS and the leap to search. Both of these search methods, both of these similarity search methods operate on non-enumerated libraries or Marcuse space. The same is true for our newest substructure search method. It's also called rule-based, rule-based substructure search. So here I'm showing the top two hits from each of the three new methods. On the left, you can see that the leap to search gives quite diverse results with a morpholine containing substituent, a pyrimidine core, and um, it doesn't have a pyrazole anywhere because none of the libraries we're searching has that group. And I should mention here that I've chosen to represent the DNA attachment point as a carboxylic acid, just for simplicity. So that's why all of the hits have that group. You don't have to build your Dell libraries the same way, it's just the way I chose to create it. Um, second, rule-based similarity search has are the two results in the center. It gives smaller and simpler compounds, and here you can see that one of the side chains has a pyrimidine, just like the reference compound, and both examples have the directly attached morpholine. And I should definitely point out here that in a huge combinatorial library, probably there are many search hits with almost the same similarity value. So just showing you two of them is not quite representing the set very well, but you can choose how many hits you want to retrieve. And then on the, the right, the right two structures, this is the rule-based substructure search. Now I had to, instead of using the entire reference compound, I had to cut it down to a more uh, truncated example so that I could get some hits. But you see the two hits are uh, fairly interesting. They contain por portions of the reference compound and uh, they're relatively small because I truncated the search. But if I were to save more hits, I could get to the larger molecules that have some aryl groups like the reference. So this is just a small sample of the search results. So another, um, another thing to point out about follow-up on DNA encoded libraries, let's say you've done a primary screening of a DNA encoded library and you have a list of hits it's always a good idea to go through your library, even though you've already screened it, uh, just to check for similar compounds which are non-hits. And of course, if you have a lot of hits, you won't be as interested in this. But if your hits are kind of sparse and you wish you had more to work with, this, this uh, similarity searching is one way you could expand your follow-up without having to run a new screen. And here's the second example use case, another thought experiment. Uh, I've been, of course, reading the literature regarding COVID, and I thought this was pretty interesting. So I found a couple of papers um, where there are fairly simple compounds that hit uh, SARS, which is another coronavirus, and compound one is actually a screening hit for SARS. And so this could represent hits from any HTS or virtual screening campaign. And then compound two is a somewhat optimized version of one where um, the potency against SARS has improved. And recently another publication reported that the second compound is also a low micromolar hit against the papain-like protease of the novel coronavirus, which is not surprising due to high similarity between the two viruses. So to expand upon a screening hit or search around a literature compound, as in this um, sorry, uh, COVID example, it can be as easy as sketching or uploading the structure which you see here in the uh, Marvin Live window. So here I'm showing the search result for 
the leap to and the rule-based search, similarity search on the literature compound from the previous slide. And you can see that in this case, leap to and the rule-based search give somewhat different results. The difference would be larger for cases where there are not highly similar compounds in libraries. However, in this case, I do have an AMID reference compound and I'm searching a very large library of amides based on commercially available amines and carboxylic acids. So I found some pretty similar hits. Uh, but anyway, if, if your libraries are not as similar to the reference compound, you'll see the two methods giving you sometimes quite different results. I'm not showing the substructure search on this slide, but the best way to use that search method is as I did before, to clip the structure of interest down to a simpler core until you start getting analogs in your virtual libraries. So you can see that these search methods can help you bring your huge virtual and real libraries under better control in the sense that now you can store and search the structures just as easily as if they were enumerated but you don't have to expend all the resources to enumerate and search one by one. So to sum up, um, representing and searching large libraries is a big challenge. And Chemaxon has long been active in helping people to meet this challenge with our tools for enumeration and chemical structure search as well as tools to help you build your cheminformatics workflows in various ways. So now we have created some new search tools that expand the range of those chemical searches beyond enumerated space to non-enumerated or Marcuse space. And this greatly increases the size of libraries that can be searched feasibly. We don't just have similarity searches, we also have the ability to perform substructure searches in non-enumerated space. So we hope that these tools can be very useful to you. And I should point out that they are currently not products, but they are uh, consultancy uh, projects. So just ask us if you're interested in trying them out. So I want to leave you with a little tip for navigating massive compound libraries. Always use the right tool to make the job much easier. And here at Chemaxon, we have many tools for these libraries. And I want to thank you for your attention and open the floor for any questions.